Good morning. Happy Sabbath. So I pray before we begin. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to consider your work on the cross for this morning, and we ask you to open our hearts to receive the blessing that you have for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the efficacy of the cross. And this uh, sermon is based on an article by Ellen White, written back in 1889, December 30th, uh, from Signs of the Times. Uh, did everybody get one of those little handouts with the fill in the blanks? Yeah. Okay. So, kind of keep track as you go along here. Some, <clears throat> some good information. So this is, uh, this is the sermon by Ellen White, <laughs> not a sermon by Tommy. So. And the word efficacy, uh, I have the definition here, uh, means the power to produce an effect. So it's the power to produce an effect. So efficacy is talking about power. It's also talking about capacity for producing a desired result or effect or effectiveness. So it's a, it's a good word. It has a very good meaning. And we want to talk about the efficacy of the cross. In other words, how did the cross have the power to produce the desired effect. Uh, how effective was the death of Jesus on the cross for solving the sin problem? And that's really that's why really why he did that. He wanted to take care of the sin problem. He wanted to pay the price for sin and put an end to sin. And does Jesus' death on the cross have the power to produce the desired effect of paying the penalty for sin and eliminating sin forever? Or we could say in a short sentence, is it a remedy? of great efficacy. And our scripture reading that we just had kind of points out uh, some of the power that was there. For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood, each one of us is talking about, we're flesh and blood. He says that he also himself likewise took part of the same. So just think about that for a moment. This is the one who created the heaven and the earth, the sea, fountains of waters and all that in the midst. God Almighty, He took flesh and blood just like you and I. In other words, He laid down His divinity. We don't know what kind of body He had before He took this body here, but He took flesh and blood just like you and I have. This is something that kind of, kind of boggles your mind when you start to think about that. But that's what He did. And the reason he did that is what it says in the next part. It says that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. In other words, God and the form of God cannot die. You can't get rid of God. You can't kill him. You can't, you can't electrocute him. You can't shoot him. He's not going to die. But he laid down that divinity, took on our flesh and blood, our human nature, so that he could die for us. And that's, a, that's an awesome thought when you think about that. And that was the only way that God determined that the penalty of death or the penalty of sin could be paid was by God giving His life for the sinner. So this is a, this is serious business we're dealing with here. And he, as He did that, it says that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Now we know that sin originated in heaven. It originated with Lucifer, who was the right-hand man of God up there. He decided that uh, God's way just didn't, was not going to work, that he had a better idea. And that's where sin originated. He was the originator of temptation. His temptations were so powerful that he was able to persuade one-third of the angels in heaven, one-third of the unfallen beings, that his plan was better than God's plan. That's how effective and how deceitful he was. <clears throat> and he became, uh, actually, so this is war in heaven. He was cast out of heaven, the Bible tells us in, in Revelation chapter 12, cast down to this earth, one-third of the angels cast down here with him, and he's been wreaking havoc on the earth for 6,000 years, and he is the cause of death. 
He is why Mike Hodges died yesterday morning. He is why everyone has died from Adam and Eve until this point. He has the power of death. But Jesus' death on the cross gave him assurance that he's going to, to destroy the one that has the power of death. So this is a real serious business we're talking about. And he says, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So, so death is a big issue for us. Uh, before I became a Christian, it was a real big issue. Today, if we look at it as just a sleep. But before you become a Christian, when you're not a Christian, it's a big issue. So Jesus' death on the cross got the victory over Satan who had the power of death and was able to deliver us who through fear of death were all our lifetime subject to bondage. Powerful promises right here. And Hebrews 2.10 says, For it became him for whom are all things. So everything down here on this earth, everything as far as you can see out there, is for God and for Jesus Christ. For whom are all things. And as far as you can see, by whom are all things. They're not only for him, but he's the one that made them all. And it says, in bringing many sons unto glory, this is what his death did on the cross, it's bringing his children to glory, it says to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So the fact that he laid down his divinity, the fact that he took flesh and blood upon himself, the fact that he was a babe in the womb of Mary, the fact that he was a little child, like this little girl sitting over here in, in the middle, and grew up into a man of 30 years old, and at the age of 31 and a half was crucified on the cross. Or that might have been age 33, I'm not sure, but in his 30s, early 30s, crucified on the cross. All the, and all the things that he suffered between, from, the, from the womb to the cross, all those things made him the perfect Lamb of God, the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And he went through a lot. He went through more than anybody on this earth ever has gone through, ever will go through. But all those sufferings made him the perfect sacrifice, the perfect gift for the price of sin. So what does the cross and the law, how do those things go together? What does Jesus' death on the cross say about the law of God? First of all, it says that his law is immutable. If God's law could have been changed, there would have been no need for anybody to die. He would say, okay, well, we'll just write that off. In the Navy, we call it waiver. So we can give you a waiver for that. <laughs> okay? But there's no waivers. His law is immutable. It cannot change. And it tells you the value of the crucifixion equals the value of the life of the Son of God. Each one of us here today has a value that is equal to the life of the Son of God. That's how valuable each one of us is. Somebody might tell you that you're useless, that you're worthless, or somebody might tell you that you're worth a certain amount, but this is your true value. You're worth the life of the Son of God. He gave His life for you, for each one of us. We're all on the same par here, all on the same level. And <clears throat> so the value of the crucifixion equals the value of the life of the Son of God equals the value of the law. So the law is extremely valuable. And Jesus' death maintained the sacredness of the law. It showed that there was no way to kind of put a little twist on it. You know, put like our, like our Bill of Rights, they had, uh, uh, they had amendments to it. There's no amendments to this. This law is written uh, perfectly to begin with, and there's no amendments. It needs no amendment. And the law of God is a transcript of his character. That's why there's no change. Because it tells us that Jesus Christ was the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's the way his law is. It's a transcript of his character. It will never change. It portrays the nature of God. And the attributes of God are unfolded as you go from commandment number one through commandment number ten. His attributes are unfolded there. <clears throat> 
So what's our purpose on here? What, why are we here on Earth anyway? What's it all about? What's that old song say? What's it all about, Alfie? It says, here's what it's all about. It says that we are here to become firmly established in the right. That's why we're here. We're here to understand the big picture. And as we become firmly established in the right, this is going to preclude any possibility of sin in the future life. Is that good news? I'm telling you, that's really good news. And it's going to assure happiness and security of all. I mean, we have spots of happiness and security here in this earth. There's some people are happy, some are secure. This is going to be everybody is going to be happy and secure. And it's a matter of divine power working with our human effort throughout our lifetime that accomplishes this within us. And as we're here, the offensive character of sin is made plain. The sufferings and death of Christ. We see how horrible that was. Uh, I mean, everything that was done to him was wrongfully done to him. And we see that. We see that Christ is going to forever bear the marks of the curse. When we see him in heaven, we will see the the marks from the thorns on his forehead. We'll see the uh, pierced side where the Roman soldiers stuck the spear in. We'll see the uh, nail marks in his hands. We'll see the nail marks in his feet. It says in Isaiah, it says, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. So that's not only just our name, that is us individually. He knows each one of us engraved in the palm of his hand. And we will be vividly impressed with the hateful character of sin as we truly study his word and listen to the Holy Spirit and lead this sanctified life. And we will more fully realize the preciousness of the offering that he made for us. That's why we're here. So what was accomplished at the cross? It was made sure the destruction of Satan. Satan had the power of death. So when you get rid of that, it, it says in 1 Timothy that, that death was abolished. So that's a, that's a real good thing to abolish, is death. And then what was accomplished there when Satan is destroyed, now this of course is going to happen after Jesus comes back and after the thousand years, and when he comes back the third time, when Satan is destroyed, there will be none left to tempt to evil. Remember, he was the guy that started this in heaven. Okay, so when he is gone, the original tempter is gone, and there's no other tempters to take his place. And atonement will never need to be repeated. And there will never be any danger of another rebellion. And even the unfalling beings are now secure forever. Right now they're still in a state of uncertainty because there could be something that another tempter pop up. But the destruction of Satan has gone up, assure their uh, security forever as well as ours. The efficacy of the cross. The angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy by what happened at the cross. And even the ones in heaven are not secure until Satan is destroyed. And we know that angelic perfection failed in heaven because Lucifer and one third of the angels failed. So being an angel doesn't assure perfection. And we know that human perfection failed in Eden. You couldn't have a more perfect scene than was made in Eden, but it failed. But now we know that our only security is in the plan of salvation. Our only security is in what Jesus did on the cross for us. And it makes manifest the love and justice of God. It shows eternal safeguard against defection. And it shows perfect trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. The value of the atonement. And, and I, 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 I have here, we don't get it, but the thing is, I don't get it, okay? Mm -hmm. Because if I did, I would talk more about it. You know, I talk about all kinds of stuff, but I don't talk much about what Jesus did on the cross in my daily conversations. Mm -hmm. But we should be talking about it because that is <laughs> the most powerful thing that's ever happened in our life. That's right. And that's what we should be talking about. It is an expression of incomprehensible love it preserved the honor of God and saved the transgressor at the same time. 
save the one that broke his law and preserved his law at the same time. I mean, it took a brilliant mind to figure out how to do that. In the theme of redemption, this is what deserves our study. It's the greatest study that can engage the human mind. I mean, we might think it's physics or nuclear physics or uh, the biological medicine that they have out there now, the way that physics and biology works together. The greatest study that can engage the human mind is the cross, the theme of redemption. Amen. And what happens when we study that is that our faith would be strengthened. We would appropriate the merits of his shed blood. We would be cleansed from our past sins and saved from future sin. I mean, this is, this is good stuff when you study this. There's no other study that's going to do that for you. Many will be lost, unfortunately. It says that broad is the way and many there be, broad is the way that leads to destruction and many there be that walk therein. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life and few there be that find it. So and why is that? Because they depend on legal religion. We all think we got to do something. So we just got to do something to get this salvation. And they depend on mere repentance. Say, well, if I just straighten this part of my life out, okay? Repentance alone cannot save you, all right? Uh, our works cannot save us. So I can repent all I want to, but those sins are still there. I mean, what is going to pay the price for that sin? It says the wages of sin is death. Okay, so I can repent all I want to, and what have I got to look, to, to look forward to? Death, because that's a penalty. In order to be saved, perfect obedience is required. And that's impossible without Christ. Guaranteed. And you can't get into heaven without it. And rebellion would rise up again without it. So our only hope is Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and Him resurrected, and Him working as our High Priest in the Holy Holies today. The blood of Christ. Man's belief in and allegiance to Christ is the only method of salvation. Nothing else. We're saved through the blood of Christ alone. I mean, you can know all about the 2300 days. You can know all about Revelation 13 and 14. You can memorize the entire Bible if you want to. It's not going to do you one bit of good without the blood of Jesus Christ. Angels are amazed at human indifference and calls to such a great sacrifice. I, can, I can't imagine. I can, I can understand the angels, but how does God feel when he looks down here and sees the people who just say, so who cares? Who cares about God? I mean... <laughs> It is totally, it's, it's incomprehensible to me that, that God still can have the patience and long-suffering and love for us that He does, considering what He sees in the seven billion people on the face of this earth. That shows what a merciful, wonderful God we have. We're taught to praise and glorify man instead of praising and glorifying God, who alone is worthy of our praise. The greatest gift... John 3.16 tells us what that is. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That shows the only two options that we have in life. We're either going to perish or we will have everlasting life. There is no in-between. There's no other way. And Romans 8.32 tells us He spared not His own Son but delivered Him up for us all. He gave His Son for every one of us and unfortunately, out of the billions and trillions of people that have been on this earth, very few accept the gift. And that's why they made the angels are just saying, what's up? Why don't they get it? Nothing has been held back. All of heaven has been poured out for our salvation. The unspeakable gift. And if that gift doesn't lead man to repentance, nothing will ever move our hearts. So you can go wherever you want to, but if what happened on the cross doesn't move your heart, nothing will. There is no power held in reserve to do it. All of the resources of heaven were poured out at the cross. 
the image of Christ. Now this is the good news here. So as we study the cross and study the plan of salvation and pray and receive the Holy Spirit into our lives, it says here that we will be perfected, the image of Christ will be perfected in all who accept the gift. And that's God's plan for us is to restore the image of God in us. So as we study the plan of redemption, we will be assured that the image of Christ will be perfected in us as we go through our life here on this earth. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So as we study Jesus Christ our Lord, we will have that transforming power working in us. The efficacy of the cross. It contains the exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The imagination cannot comprehend the benefits. We don't know. We can't even begin to understand how good it's going to be. And we can't, it cannot be fully comprehended by human thought, and it's too grand to be fully embraced by finite comprehension. Here's a quote from Reserve of Ages, page 83, paragraph 5. It says, as we associate together, we may be a blessing to one another. The key word there may be <laughs> a blessing to one another. If we are Christ, our sweetest thoughts will be of Him. We shall love to talk of Him, and as we speak to one another of His love, our hearts will be softened by divine influences. So how do we get our hearts softened? By talking to one another about the love of Christ for us. Beholding the beauty of His character, we shall be changed into the same image from glory to glory. So this is that image of Christ being perfected in us as we talk about His love for us. <clears throat> and we'll wind up with Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 to 13. You can turn in your Bibles there, or maybe you can read it here. <clears throat> this is what it's like in heaven. They're praising God in heaven. They are very much in love with the Lamb that gave His life. And it, it goes on. They, they praise God. And they praise the Lamb. And they know that He's worthy. And I'm thinking we need to get in that mode here if we're going to be in that mode there. I don't think it's going to be a flip switch. I think it's, we have to get there while we're here. And they sung a new song. That's going to be our how Christ saved each one of us. Each one of us will have His own song. And none of them in heaven are going to know that because they've, they've, they're unfallen beings. So we can tell them what it was like to be subject to death, have the penalty of death staring us in the face, and be delivered from it. That'll be our song. And each one of us will have a little different song. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain. They're talking to the Lamb and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. He doesn't care you know, what your nationality is, where you live, what you look like. He has shed his blood for you. And has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So he's got a plan for us. A future plan that's right here on this earth made new. We will be reigning as kings and priests on this earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beast, and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands. These are all the unfallen beings. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them heard us saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. So that's the conversation in heaven. And that's the kind of conversation that we should be having here on earth to prepare for that. So praise God for the efficacy of the cross.